We're so glad you chose to come and worship with us today, whether you're here in person or you're worshiping online. We're so glad you're with us. If you have your Bibles today, and I hope that you do, uh, will you get them out and turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is where we're going to be uh, landing this morning. And as you're turning there, uh, if this is your first week here or your first week in a while, we're in the middle of what we're calling a spiritual journey. And what that is, is it's where we as an entire church, all of our small groups, our student ministry, everybody, are walking through this one passage of Scripture together, seeking to see what God would have for us. And so I wanted to, I wanted to just put that Scripture up for us to read uh, together, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 1. This is Paul writing, he says this, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so what, what we've been asking ourselves the last couple of weeks, what we're going to continue asking ourselves over the next several weeks is this, what does it look like to live this thing out? What, what does it look like to actually walk out, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And as I, was, as I was looking at this, this last week, uh, the one thing I was noticing about this passage is everything mentioned in this passage of Scripture is the exact opposite of what culture screams at us. Everything that we're called to by Paul here is the exact opposite of what we desire, or as the Bible talked about in our flesh before Jesus, that we want. It's the exact opposite of that. Like Mark talked about last week, he talked about humility and seeking humility. And I don't know about you, but I can speak for myself and say, I don't like being humbled. Instead, I like being exalted. I like that. I like it when people think highly of me and speak highly of me. So we're going to talk about uh, gentleness today. You know, I, I, I'm not prone to, I, I would rather, you know, kind of make my way happen and, and speak abrasively and make it because at the end of the day, kindness doesn't get the job done, right? We need to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Or, or as, as we continue further, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, you know, I, I think that's maybe the most foreign concept in American culture today. We can't maintain the unity of anything. Even political parties can't find unity in one another. You know, there's no unity. Unity. And so what in the world is this talking about? As, as I was thinking about this this last week, we shouldn't have named the series Walk the Walk. We should have named the series Swimming Upstream, because that's what it feels like we're doing as we're seeking to live this thing out. But wasn't Jesus that way? Whenever you read the Gospels, I mean, wasn't it Jesus that said, hey, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose your life? Or wasn't it Jesus that said, hey, you're, the people that persecute you, you need to pray for them, not curse them. You need to pray for them. You need to love your enemies. Jesus was countercultural before being countercultural was ever cool. And so we, we see today, and, and the text that we're going to look at today is, is one quality that's mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, where Paul says that we are to live our lives, we're to walk the walk with all humility and gentleness. Gentleness. Now, this, this idea of gentleness is not something that, that we're super familiar with. It's not something that we look favorably upon. In fact, if I were to ask everybody in here, but especially the men, like, hey, you know, the one character quality that you want to be named for is gentleness, right? All the guys would say, no, <laughs> I'm brave, bold, uh, woof, right? But not gentle. What is, gentleness, what does that mean? And as I was thinking about this last week, I had a hard time even coming to grips with what gentleness even means or what it means to be gentle because I feel like it's so far removed from our culture. The, the concept of gentleness now is such a negative connotation, but, but what's interesting is that it hasn't always been that way. And not just in our culture. In fact, in every culture, the, the concept of gentleness is, is something that, that, that's aspired to. It is something that, 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 honestly, in most cultures, they have words that describe. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to throw the first one. You're familiar with the first one in English. The word that we have uh, for this is gentleman. Gentleman. When you think of a gentleman, uh, you think of someone that's prim or proper or does things the right way way. And etymologically, this makes sense, right? Gentle man. And so we, we get this. 
Uh, but, but this came from the Greco-Roman times, and it actually meant a son of nobility. And then as, as we kind of continued on into the Middle Ages and in the 1800s even, what we see is that this concept grew to mean kind of a man that was chivalrous, that, that carried out chivalry, that stood up for what was right. I came across this definition that was given by a pastor, John Vernon, in 1869. He said this, he said, the gentleman is always truthful and sincere, will not agree for the sake of compliance or out of weakness, will not pass over that which he disproves. He has a clear soul and a fearless, straightforward tongue. On the other hand, he is not blunt and rude. His truth is courteous, his courtesy truthful, never a humbug, yet where he truthfully can, he prefers to say pleasant things." And this isn't, this isn't only isolated in our culture. Uh, th- this is also in Far Eastern culture. There's this concept, actually, in, in Chinese, there, there's a word uh, that means the very, very similar thing called junzi. And it, it means a ruler's son, so the son of a ruler. And this is kind of born out of Confucianism, and so it's slightly different than, than where we get our gentleman word from. But it's still the idea of being noble, standing up for what's right, doing the right thing. What's intriguing is that in Chinese, there's actually also an antonym. The opposite of junzi is xiaoren, or literally translated, small person, which is really funny because when you think about it, someone that isn't this, that isn't a gentleman, ends up being a really small person, someone that's self-obsessed, self-absorbed, all about me, 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 and getting what I want and doing whatever it takes to get what I want. And we all know someone like that, right? And if you don't, then a lot of people know you. <laughs> it might be you. But, but what, what, what is this idea of gentleness? What, what, what's being spoken of here, but maybe even more importantly, more than these helpful definitions in different cultures, what is Paul talking about here? What, what did Paul mean when he called us to walk the walk in gentleness? To walk the walk in gentleness. And the the, the good news is, we don't have to guess at what this means. In fact, in another place, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Paul says, if you want to know what it looks like to live out any character quality, if you want to know what it looks like to live out the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, if you want to know what that looks like, that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. And so, believer, if you want to know what it looks like to live any of those things out, we don't look necessarily to human influences, though we can see these things played out from time to time in one another, we look to our King Jesus. We look to the Gospels and see, okay, how did Jesus live this thing out? And that takes us to our text today in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, where we're going to find ourselves in John 8 today is maybe one of the most powerful representations of gentleness that we have from Christ in all four Gospels. So we're going we're gonna to pick up in John chapter 7, uh, verse 53. You can follow me in your Bibles or on the screens. John writes these words. He says, They each went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. So where we pick up in John chapter 8, it seems like Jesus is at a kind of a bit of a conundrum, a catch-22, if you will. The text says that scribes and Pharisees come to Jesus. If you're unfamiliar with kind of Bible characters, the scribes were the experts in the law, the PhDs in the Old Testament. In fact, many of these guys had the entire Old Testament 
memorize. Can you imagine that? Most of you don't even know all 50 states in America, and these guys had the entire Old Testament memorized. And so, so the scribes come, but they also come with the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were slightly different from the scribes in that the Pharisees, what they did was they devoted their lives to keeping up the law. They made it their goal to keep the law. And so there's separate groups of people of not all Pharisees were scribes, but some scribes were Pharisees. You see it? So, so they come together, and, and they come, and, and their motive is made clear in verse 6. Their goal is they are trying to trip up Jesus. And the way that they do this is at the expense of the vulnerable, which can't just say this today. That's still the way that this happens today. Oftentimes, if people are trying to trip up other people, it's at the expense of the vulnerable, at the expense of people that can't stand up for themselves. And so what they, what they do, what, what it says they do, is they find and bring a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. Now, to be clear about the language that's spoken of here, this isn't someone that is known to be promiscuous or might be taking part. This is someone that was caught in the act by witnesses. If you read Bible scholars, most people think this woman was set up. And I think this woman was set up for a bunch of different reasons. One, where's the man, right? It takes two to tango, and there's only one here. So, so where's, where's the guy at? Why is, why is only the woman brought forth, and the way in which she was brought forth. How did this happen? But what we see is this woman is dragged to the temple and thrown before Jesus. Might be bruised, probably naked or half naked, and thrown before him. Just for a second, can you imagine being the woman in this story? I want you to put yourself in her shoes. Think of, think of the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that she would have felt in that moment. And not just that she felt that was being leveled at her. I mean, I don't know, but I, I've never had a group of people throw me before the church and then shout out the most horrific, dark secrets of my entire life before the entire congregation. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. If it has, then I've got some good counselors that we need to talk about going to, because that's horrific. It's horrific. Can you imagine that? And these, these religious leaders aren't just condemning her guilty, they are calling for her death. They're condemning. Imagine what she must have felt. This is really similar to our culture today, this crucifixion culture where, man, regardless of your viewpoint, if you disagree with someone else or if someone is your enemy, you want to take them out, right? We, we see that in politics. We see that in celebrities. We see that in all kinds of people we look up to, that people want to take people out, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. And this is rooted in a dark view of humanity, kind of a, a black and white view of humanity of people are either good or they're bad. There is no middle ground, and the people that are bad, we would never be bad like them. But in all honesty, Christians, we know the biblical truth about humanity, that actually it's a little bit more complicated than that, that, that all people are both made in the image of God and also broken. We know that, that all people both are incredibly loved by God, like we just sang a little bit uh, ago, that God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal. We sang that. All people are loved by God, but also at the exact same time, outside of Christ, all people are under the wrath of God. And can I just say this in, in passing? My fear, Christian, is that for those of us that are trying to walk the walk and live out this Christian thing, that far too often we expect non-believers to act like believers. And that's fallacious. Why? Because we expect people to follow this and they've never even heard of it before. They, they have no frame of reference. But even beyond that, even though they've heard of the Bible, they haven't experienced what we've experienced. 
Christians, and we need to be clear about truth. I'm not saying we need to water down the gospel or not be honest about sin or, or, or change what sin means. No, not, not at all. We need to stand for truth. We need to be clear about sin. But at the exact same time, believers, we should be the greatest teachers of God's grace. We should, we should be trumpeting the grace of God. Why? Because more than anyone else in the world, we've experienced his grace. I mean, Christian, have you experienced the grace of our God? Have you forgotten what it is to be lost and now be found, to be separated but now be brought to him, to be far away and have the Father run to you in your lostness? We've experienced the grace of God. May we be people that expound on grace, that offer grace. May we be people that don't sit back and yell, crucify him, but instead run to people and pay extraordinary cost for grace. Because ultimately, and anyone that's ever extended grace knows this, grace is costly. It's hard giving grace. It's hard forgiving if you actually do it. So the first question I want to give to you talking about Christian gentleness is this. Christian gentleness asks this question. Are you calling for another's crucifixion or paying the cost of extraordinary grace? Are you personally, are we together collectively as believers, are we calling out others or are we paying the cost of what it, what it costs us to extend grace. Now, I want to be so clear. We can't pay the cost that Jesus paid. He already paid the cost on the cross. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is extending grace in a way that's costly to you as well. But back to the story. We, we see in the story that this woman is thrown before Jesus. And it's pointed out, and this is true, that the Mosaic law is clear that if adulterers are caught in the act, they are to be put to death. And actually, Ezekiel tells us that the prescribed death penalty to be leveled at adulterers is stoning. Now, this is, this is foreign and even barbaric to us today. We, we don't do this anymore. But what this looked like was, it looked like tying someone down or sometimes burying them up to their heads, and the accusers and the entire village surrounding them with rocks at least this big, but preferably bigger, and the accusers first, the ones that caught them, were to pelt them with rocks until their death. And the goal was to get the biggest rocks that you could and to make this thing go quickly. This was a horrific punishment, and the goal of stoning someone was equally punitive and illustrative. Right? The, the goal of this was it was so horrific that it sent a message to everyone else in the community that, man, you don't want to do this because you don't want the cost that's associated with this thing. And so what, what we see is these religious leaders, they come and they throw this woman before Jesus and they ask, they, they say, hey, here's what the law says. What do you say? And again, we see their motive. They're trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus is in a tough place. Because if, if Jesus chooses to not stone the woman, then he will be directly contradicting God's law. Thereby vilifying him as the heretic that all these religious leaders are trying to accuse him of being. But if he stones her, if he calls out for her stoning, then, then he's nullifying the grace and the hope that he's been trumpeting in his ministry this far. But to take it a step further, there's also a political element that we can't see today that was going on at this exact same time. You see, at this time, the Jews were under Roman occupation. They were subservient to the Roman Empire. And so the Jews did not have the authority to carry out the death penalty. In fact, this, this is why Jesus was brought before Caesar later when he gets crucified, because the Jews didn't have the authority to do this without Roman approval. And an act of murder would be considered insurrection. And so what they're asking Jesus to do is, they're asking Jesus, hey, Jesus, you're calling yourself the Messiah. Let's start this new kingdom thing. You're big and bad, go ahead, start this thing over here and see if you defeat the Romans. Are you willing to stand up politically to the ones that are in power right now? What are you going to do, Jesus? 
So again, Jesus is faced with this decision. Does he disobey God's law and sin? Or destroy his message of hope and redemption and in the process seek seek legal trouble with the Roman Empire? And again, these leaders' goal is not some sort of justice. Their goal is to catch Jesus and to get rid of him because he's a pest. And what's, what's intriguing is, at this moment, the text tells us that Jesus, right after they ask him the question, bends down and starts playing in the sand like a little kid. He starts riding in the sand, and the text says they keep asking him questions as he's riding in the sand. Now, we don't, we don't know what Jesus was riding. He could have been riding all kinds of things. Maybe Jesus was writing out every single one of their sins, right? Because he's omniscient and he knew them, so he could have, in the same way they threw this woman before him, maybe he was saying, oh, you, yeah, gossip, you, you knew this woman before you brought her here because you knew this woman, you know, like, you did this, you did that. He, he's calling out their sins. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe Jesus is writing down, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Or, or, or maybe he's just writing what, how he wants John to write Revelation. We don't know what he's writing. But one thing is clear, that Jesus is a really precarious way to answer this question. Start writing. But he does. And they don't let this thing go. They, they perceive him as ignoring them, as ditching the question, and they won't let it go. And so it says that they continue badgering Jesus, continue asking him a question, and it says that he stands up and he says this. He says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now remember, the religious leaders, they're over here, and they're carrying their stones. They're ready to take her out. And Jesus says, Whoever's without sin, have at her. And then it says that Jesus goes back to drawing in the sand, like, like my four-year-old would love to draw in the sand. And the text says that slowly, one by one, starting with the older ones, the religious leaders leave. I want you to picture this. The religious leaders, the people that were experts in the law come in the stone this woman, ready to enact justice. Slowly, you begin to hear their stones fall on the temple courts. And they walk away. It says that Jesus continues uh, drawn in the sand. And once they're all gone, look at how he uh, greets this woman. Verse 10. It says, Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Don't miss what Jesus says to her. He he asks her a question, and this question isn't for him. He knows all things. The question is actually for her. He asks her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Where are your accusers? See, what what Jesus is doing here is he is punctuating what had just happened theologically here. He is reminding this woman of the theological truth that Paul would write about later, that Isaiah prophesied about earlier, that there is no one righteous, though not even one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yeah, sin's different, and it carries different consequences. If you go and you steal a cookie at home, that's a little bit different than if you go and cheat on your wife. The the earthly consequences of that are going to be slightly different, but at the end of the day before our holy God, sin is sin is sin is sin. And Jesus is reminding her, hey, you're not alone in your sin. All of these men sin. The ones that are accusing you right now, they're all sinners too. But he also tells her this. He tells her to go and sin no more. 
He says, I don't condemn you, and go and sin no more. What he's doing, he's doing two, there's twofold action happening here. The very first thing he's doing is he's granting mercy for her sin. She had sinned. She deserved death, according to God. She deserved death. What Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not going to give you death. I'm giving you mercy. And there's someone in here today that needs to hear that Christ is looking down upon you today and saying, no, 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 I don't want to give you death. I want to give you mercy. Do you know my mercy today? Mercy is what I want to extend to you. But not only is Jesus extending mercy, he takes this a step further and he says, I'm giving you mercy, but I'm not just giving you mercy. I'm also giving you the grace to no longer sin this way. So Christian, whatever sin you struggle with, whatever, if it's anger, if it's pride, I had a small group member uh, share this this last week. I thought this was brilliant. He said, you know, pride is one of the most difficult sins to struggle with because in pride, I don't feel guilty for being prideful because I think I deserve to be prideful. Maybe pride is, a, or some form of sexual sin, whatever, whatever the sin is that you struggle with, what Jesus is telling her and what Jesus would want to tell you, Christian, is that through his cross and resurrection, he now extends you the grace to no longer walk in that. There's a new power being exerted on earth, a power that never had existed until this moment, and Jesus offers her both mercy and grace. Jesus, the only one that's worthy to pick up a stone and throw at this woman, chooses not to. He chooses not to. So, how do we walk in Christian gentleness? I want to show you a couple of ways that Jesus' actions were the exact opposite of the Pharisees and the scribes' actions, and hopefully uh, give us some handles on how we can live this thing out. Okay, so the the very first thing I want you to see from this text is that Christian gentleness is humbly self-aware. Christian gentleness is humbly self-aware. Now contrast that with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were completely unaware. They could not see all the different ways that they were sinning and bringing this woman and throwing her before Jesus. They didn't see how they were showing favoritism toward her and not bringing the guy with her. Remember, there were two there, and they only bring the woman. Why did they only bring the woman? Because they're showing favoritism over here. They can't see the ways that they're breaking God's commandments in an attempt at legalism, in an attempt to obey. They were completely unaware. Being self-aware is hard. It requires humility. The people that I know that struggle most with self-awareness are also the people that maybe struggle the most with pride. But self-awareness is something we can all work on. This last week I was thinking about self-awareness and I was reminded of uh, my student ministry days. Some of you know this, some of you don't know this. I was actually a student pastor up here for six or seven years before I assumed my new role at this church. And I loved it. Student ministry was so fun. It was exciting. And and can I just say, I'm so grateful that I work at a church that values student ministry. I, I am so grateful that they have a budget, that they have an incredible staff. I believe that Brandon and Fallon are some of the best student pastors in this area. I'm grateful for them and their interns and the work that they do for our students and for the next generation. I'm so grateful for them. And, and I, I love student ministry. But it never failed. Every, every student ministry trip that we took, we took kids as young as 12 and as old as 18. Maybe 19 if they failed more than once. But around 18 was, was normally the, the cutoff age for events. And, and so we would take 12. To, so, so I say that to say, if you haven't parented that age group yet, that is every awkward age of puberty that exists right? They're all over the map, all over the place. And it never failed every single year that we would take students on any trip, name the trip, mission trip, youth camp, whatever, a weekend away, whatever it was. There would be, without fail, at least one, most times more than one, junior high boy that had hit puberty and didn't know it and needed to wear deodorant but didn't. You know, not completely unaware Junior high girls don't struggle with that. They wear their deodorant. But the junior high boys, man, oh my goodness, the funk. And so we would have to, we would have to go and we'd have to, I would have to have this conversation. Normally I would make the interns have this conversation, but, but we'd have a conversation with this junior high boy of, hey, did you forget your deodorant? 
And he would probably say, no, I don't wear deodorant. And say, well, you need to. <laughs> Here you go. You know, you go put this on. Don't come out until you do. You know, that, that kind of thing. But they, they were completely unaware that they had some rank BO and stunk bad and they needed it. Completely unaware. And I think, I think sometimes Christians, we can walk around completely unaware of our spiritual B.O. I, I, I think we can walk around and be totally unaware of how our presence affects a room, or how when we're around a group of people, the influence that we have for good or for bad, or how the words that we speak affect our kids for good or for bad. How we have the ability to speak life or speak death into people's lives. I just wonder where you're at with self-awareness. The great thing about self-awareness is it's a journey. You never arrive. The only person that was ever fully self-aware is Jesus. So so the good news is we're all equal right now in that we all need to work on self-awareness. For some, that might be a brand new concept, but for all in this room, we all need to work on how we are coming across to others because gentleness begins with self-awareness. You won't be able to be gentle unless you are aware of how you are impacting others. It's a part of it. But second, Christian gentleness speaks difficult truth that leads to life. Christian gentleness speaks difficult truth that leads to life. Oftentimes in our culture, it's trumpeted that gentleness means niceness. And so if I'm gentle, I need to be nice all the time, even if that means lying. I will lie so that I can come across as nice because I am trying to be gentle. It's kind of like for those that are married in the room today, if your spouse, be it husband or wife, if your spouse uh, comes out of the closet asking, how does this make me look? The right answer is not to answer, right? That, that's a, that's the right answer. That, that's a dangerous question any way you do it. Like, you look great. No, I don't. It's a, you know, or, you, oh, I don't know. Don't ever say that one. That, that's the way wrong one. But, but we, we get confused. You know, that, that, that's a hard thing. Why is it hard? Because we want to be nice. We don't want to speak the hard truth. Sometimes, I'm putting her on the spot. Sometimes I will walk out and my wife, the gentle way that she tells me that is, are you wearing that today? And that's my cue. I know it's time to go change. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, but but we, we need to be able to speak the truth. You see, gentleness isn't always nice, but it is always good. Christian gentleness doesn't forsake truth, but brings truth in kindness for someone else's benefit. This is a really hard part for our hyper-individualistic uh, culture, where we think that we always know best, and we don't really make decisions with community engagement. We don't make decisions even with family involvement. Normally, we're like, I know I am, I'm going to make this decision. I don't need anybody. And can I just say, men are the worst at this. Men, men, men are even worse than women in this sort of like, I am an island. I don't need anybody else. I've got this. I'm self-sustaining, right? The, those, are, those are high values in American culture. I can provide for myself. I can take care of myself. I can hunt, and I can kill it, and I can cook it. Hoorah, right? That, that's us. That's what we think. But we need others. God designed us to need others other people to speak into our lives, but it's hard because it sounds and feels sometimes judgmental. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever said or thought, who are you to judge me? Or, or the famous, only God can judge me. Well, actually, Jesus gives a lot of authority to the local church. Actually, we need other believers' judgment, not, not to condemn us, but to speak truthfully in us. We need Christians to judge the fruit of our lives. We need Christians to speak in us and say, man, I just don't know about that. Or you feel called, are you sure you feel called to that? I just don't see how that lines up with Scripture. 
Man, if you make that decision, that's going to have a serious negative impact on your family. We need people that are willing to speak truth into our lives. I think there's so many Christians, I've heard so many Christians say, man, I just don't understand why the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me. And maybe the reason that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you is because you're not willing to humble yourselves and listen to the Holy Spirit through your brothers and sisters. I mean, do we not believe that the Holy Spirit indwells all of us? Do we not believe that? Do, I, do we not believe that, man, you can speak into my life in the same way that I can speak into your life? That's the priesthood of the belief. We believe that. We're all equal in that way. We need one another, and we need to hear from Him. And, and God might not be being silent to you. He might be shouting to you, and you're just tuning Him out because you pridefully are unwilling to engage in community. The irony in, in this whole story is that Jesus was the only one who had the authority to cast the stone. He's the only one that had the authority, the power. He was the only one that was sinless to cast the stone. If you look at Jesus, what he did was he did not leverage his authority to bring about awful things on someone else. He also didn't leverage his authority to advance himself. He leveraged his authority to build up another. You want to know what Christian gentleness looks like? It looks like leveraging your authority and your power and your identity and who God made you to be for someone else. That's what Christian gentleness looks like. You see, Jesus knew this. He knew where he was headed. He knew he was on his way to the cross. They didn't know it yet. None of them knew it yet. Not even his closest confidence. They did not know it yet. They all thought that Jesus was about to start a rebellion. In fact, Peter was probably like, hey, Jesus, you need a stone? I've got a couple. Like, go ahead, take it. You need that? They had no idea. But Jesus knew where he was headed. And Jesus knew long before he met this woman at his feet in the temple that he was going to the cross to die for her. Jesus knew long ago, before he was ever even sent in the world, that actually the reason why Jesus came in the first place was to forgive and bring close men and women just like her. This is why Paul can so audaciously write, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Not because your condemnation just disappears like fairy dust, your condemnation is just gone. No, it's because Jesus takes your condemnation to the cross and hangs it there in his body. That's why there therefore is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus bled for your condemnation. Jesus suffered for your condemnation. Jesus died for your condemnation. So believer, you don't have to walk in it anymore. There's someone in here today that needs to hear that, Christian, that condemnation is not yours in Christ. That Jesus would say the same thing to you that he said to that woman, neither do I condemn you. Follow him. Follow him. See, the the last point that I want to make is this. You will never know Christian gentleness until you know Christ. Because Christian gentleness begins with Christ. It begins with him. There there are many of us that, man, we grow up in, in church and we know different aspects of God. And sometimes, honestly, taking aspects of God and not a holistic view of God is where heresy comes into the church, right? We only think of God as this wrathful, avenging person that just wants to take us out. Or the opposite, we think of God as only lo- like a loving fairy that, that's just here to make all your wishes come true. And he just loves you. And, and both of those things are true. God is loving and he's also wrathful. But also hear this today, Christian, Jesus Christ is a conquering king who is Lord over all and sovereign over all, but Jesus Christ is also a gentle savior that's pursuing you today. He's pursuing you and where you are. You will never be able to live a lifestyle of gentleness, genuine gentleness, until you truly receive the gentleness expressed to you from our great God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I just wonder, I wonder if you've met him before. I'm not asking if you've ever gone to church. I know there's a lot of people that grow up in church or Christian culture, and and that's great. But do you know 
the gentleness of your Savior. Living out this Christian gentleness thing, it's really, really, really hard. It doesn't come naturally. This last week, I got a phone call about something up here at the church that a business is going to charge us significantly more than I thought. And let me tell you, my anger came up here really fast. And, and I, I was, I, I'm very grateful that I was preaching on gentleness this week <laughs> because I, I was not feeling very gentle. Like, that's my church. You're not going to do that to my, you know, that, that's how I was feeling. Gentleness is never easy. It will always be the road less traveled. It will always cost you more. But gentleness is kind of like investing in a Roth IRA or a 401k. You invest in that, not for the immediate reward, you invest in that because you know a reward's coming that's greater than, than the investment that you're making right now. Christian, your investment in gentleness will secure you a reward with others, but also let us not forget there is a reward awaiting us with our Savior that transcends anything in this world. We can't even begin to fathom the reward that is for us in Christ. So may we walk the walk that's worthy of the calling that we have received. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for today. God, thank you for your word. God, I I ask that you would stir in us. God, help us to be people that are known for gentleness. God, help us to be people that trumpet truth, but do so kindly. And God, help us to be people that are teachers of grace. God, that the world would learn of your grace through your church. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone said?